this evening to this uh, second installment, I should say, of the speaker series on complexity of pandemics of uh, the WHO hub that is here in Berlin. I want to say a special welcome to our co-host, uh, Professor Axel Pries from the Charité, and of course a very special welcome to the State Secretary, Dr. Steffen, who is also here with us. So uh, we are delighted uh, to have you all here, and uh, of course uh, you have uh, seen the title of this, uh, and this discussion today is uh, closer to the heart of some of us than perhaps others. Let me just ask you, how many social scientists are in the room? Chikwe, have a look. So uh, quite a lot. So you can see we can reach out uh, to other constituencies also uh, through this. But before I lead you further into our program and the speakers and what we intend to do, I would uh, like uh, to uh, give the podium to Chikwe Ihekriazu, uh, who is, as you all know, the director of the hub here and also an assistant director general of the World Health Organization at the World Health Organization in Geneva. So please, Chikwe, do take the podium. Uh, thanks, Ilona, and, and thanks, friends, for coming to our second of uh, our speaker series. Um, you know, today is a really special event that I look forward to actually learning. I'll, I'll tell you a small story. Um, it was in, in 2002. I was the first year of my EPIAT program. Uh, uh, we were, I, I was lucky was deployed as part of a WHO mission uh, to Yambio in South Sudan. It was my first Ebola outbreak. I've done a series since then. But, um, you know, even for us that live and come out of the African continent, South Sudan is a unique place. At the time, it was just coming out of a protected crisis. Um, I thought I'd seen poverty. But really, um, South Sudan kind of redefined what it meant for me. But why is that important today? We had a colleague who you will hear from in one of the videos, Asiya Udugle. She was part of the team. And, you know, this was a team with lots of eminent epidemiologists. But in the field, Asiya was the single most important member of that team, right? And she was the social scientist in the team. So, you know, it, it really, it was fairly early in my career and it left, um, it left the mark. And I think since then, and you'll hear some stories about that today and different perspectives, um, you know, I've recognized the importance of that area of work to the response. But at the time, I also kind of compartmentalized it, that this is necessary, you know, in, in Africa, in, in difficult situations, in Ebola outbreaks. You know, until we were hit by the pandemic. Uh, and then, you know, we've all lived through it, still living through it, and we can see how difficult it's been uh, to manage. Um, so this is obviously not a problem or a challenge or an area that is limited to um, lower middle income countries. This is a challenge that we're all facing in our societies right now, even as we're still in this pandemic. So today is a really fascinating. Uh, we'll go through a fascinating session. I look forward to the, to the talks with a lot of, you know, uh, excitement about what there is to learn. And um, really welcome you again to this event. The, the work that we're trying to curate, because I, I don't use the word do, because this is not something we can do as WHO. It's really the best we can do is mobilize the world around these problems and mobilize the world's resources to focus on this. And that's why we've used the word complexity, because these are really a set of complex challenges that we have. So I really invite you to join us, to think with us. Uh, but this, unlike an academic session, they are important. Uh, our speaker series are not just for us to think about this. Every event we have, we will go back, continue that work in the hub. So whatever comes out today, we are starting 
a, a series of projects, initiatives uh, on social science, on how to link data uh, on how we behave as humans into the rest of uh, the data we're used to working and how important that is and really driving the world forward in that direction as much as we can. So thank you for sparing some, uh, uh, some time to share your evening with us. We hope to make it worth it for you and I uh, really invite you to join us on this journey as we continue building up this exciting community in Berlin, in Germany, uh, focusing on the biggest uh, challenges that we face in global health. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chikwe. And of course, we have this great group of people in the room, but there is a live stream. Uh, people can join us from all over the world, and they can also, once this event is over, uh, revisit it or ask others to join in. Last evening, I was at an event of the Charité uh, where uh, some research was being presented, clinical research. I didn't understand a word, uh, but thank God I had Axel Priest to explain some of it to me afterwards. So I feel much more on home ground. And uh, with uh, Chikwe uh, telling his story, I can say when I came to the World Health Organization at the time in Copenhagen, uh, I was uh, the only social scientist. I was a young woman. Uh, and uh, I was, yeah, I was sort of alone. Uh, and uh, it was quite a journey to actually, in the context of a medical environment, to uh, have the kind of discussions that we're going to have with you today. And uh, I think uh, exploring that together will be really important uh, because there are different kinds of complexities that uh, actually are at stake. How we will approach that today, we will have uh, two presentations by some eminent speakers that I'll introduce then. Then we have a short video which allows us to have additional voices from all around the world on this issue, how, why insights from the social science are important for uh, our understanding of collaborative intelligence to deal with uh, pandemics. Then we'll have a panel discussion and you also can pose questions, but we will do that virtually so that also people who are online uh, can uh, pose their questions as well. And then we hope many of you will stay to intermingle afterwards and have discussions amongst yourselves or uh, want to have uh, more communication uh, with the speakers. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, somebody who's probably uh, one of the best known people in Denmark at this point in time still. Uh, that is Professor Michael bang Peterson from the University of Aarhus. He's a political scientist from the field of political psychology. And probably he'll tell you himself how he ended up with uh, investigating uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and the uh, response of the population uh, to that pandemic and how he got to be an advisor to the Danish government on uh, the... Uh, on the issues on how to deal with the pandemic. And he deals with one of the most important issues, and all of us have realized this uh, over the course of the pandemic, the issue of trust. So he will share with us the major res results uh, of his research, and uh, we will then have an opportunity to discuss that. What we have done is invited a researcher from political science who looks more at the larger uh, issues, also some of the structural issues that are involved, and has been advising governments, etc. And then we have an on-the-ground perspective from anthropology to also show the scope of social sciences that uh, we are thinking of. So, Michael, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and I will just see if I can get the slides to change. 
But in the meantime, I can say that I, I will not here on, on stage share the unlikely uh, story of, uh, of uh, how I became an advisor to the Danish government uh, during uh, COVID. But what I will do is I will tell some of the important lessons that I learned in that process and uh, coming out of the research that I've been doing and am still doing uh, as part of that. So one of the core things uh, to understand when we have with a health crisis uh, to do is that health science is important. That seems obvious. We need to understand uh, the virus. We need to understand how it is spreading, how we can reduce the effect of that spread uh, through vaccines, through uh, treatments. But it's also crucial to understand that people are central in a health crisis because a virus is spreading through people and it's by the behavior changes that people do that we actually can stop the spread through mask wearing, through getting vaccinations. Furthermore, it is also people who are experiencing the costs or the side effects of the interventions that we do uh, to limit uh, infection uh, spread. It's them who suffer loneliness. It's them who suffer a loss of uh, control. It's them who suffer uh, economic insecurity. Understanding human behavior on uh, human attitudes and human feelings is the core topic of the social sciences. So from that perspective, social science is or needs to be at the center of any health crisis both in devising the solutions, how do we facilitate behavior change, but also in understanding the consequences. This, I believe, is uh, evident when we look into one of the most core social science concepts that exist, namely trust. Human cooperative relationships, they are built on trust. I will help you tomorrow if I trust that you will help me today. So trust is central in producing collective solutions to the problems we face. And we know that countries with higher trust, they are richer, they are more free, and they are more happy. This we also uh, can see during the pandemic. Research in the early phases uh, of the pandemic uh, showed that in countries with higher trust, uh, there was a larger behavior change uh, and accordingly lower infections uh, in, uh, in the first wave. Research that I've been involved in also shows that in countries where there is higher uh, trust in the health authorities, there is a much higher uh, uh, willingness to get vaccinated. And in fact, according to the research that we've been doing, then trust in the health authorities is the key predictor of vaccination willingness uh, when it comes to uh, COVID vaccines. From that, it's also probably not surprising uh, that uh, the overall infection spread and fatalities from the COVID pandemic is closely tied to trust levels in uh, different countries. I come from Denmark, which means that I come from a very privileged uh, position in terms of trust. Denmark is uh, often at the top of uh, different uh, international rankings of, uh, of trust. And this research team uh, used Denmark as the, as the benchmark in order to understand, well, how would it look, how would the pandemic look if uh, countries, other countries had uh, as high trust as uh, Denmark? And what they found was that uh, if there was the same level of trust in the government, then we would have 13% less uh, infections globally. And if there had been the same level of trust in uh, your fellow citizens, then there would have been a staggering 40% uh, lower uh, infection uh, load uh, globally. So trust matters a lot. It is part of the key solutions uh, doing a pandemic. The problem, though, is that the research that we've been doing during the pandemic shows that trust was, in fact, eroded during the crisis. We can see falling uh, levels of trust in the political system and falling levels of trust in the overall management of the pandemic as the uh, pandemic uh, unfolded. 
This happened in Denmark, but it also happened in uh, the other countries uh, that we were studying. So what is crucial to understand is how can we sustain trust? How can we maintain trust during a crisis? And the central insight from the social sciences is that you build trust by placing trust. And by that I mean that in order to sustain trust as a decision maker, you need to trust those that you make decisions about. As a government, as an authority, you need to trust citizens. That is the crucial way in which you can actually uh, get them to trust you in return. And now I will try to give you some examples of that. And the first example uh, focuses on uh, vaccines. One of the research projects uh, that uh, we have been doing uh, during the uh, pandemic focused on vaccine communication and how it is crucial to be extremely transparent in the communication that you are giving about vaccines. We did an experiment with almost uh, 7,000 Danes and Americans where we presented them with information about a new fictitious uh, co uh, COVID uh, vaccine called Covaxit. This was before the rollout of the vaccines. And we uh, provide them information with the effectiveness and side effects of this vaccine. But we did it in slightly different ways. So some groups were... Uh, presented with very transparent data on the vaccines, but data that shows that this, this was actually not a super good vaccine. Uh, it had some uh, pretty bad side effects and it wasn't that effective. That was what we call transparent negative communication. There were also other uh, uh, groups in the experiment who received transparent positive information. But here we'll focus on the transparent negative information and then on another group, which we call uh, vague reassurance or vague, vague reassuring communication. So this group uh, was exposed to a kind of vaccine communication that you sometimes see uh, politicians or health authorities engage in, where they don't give the details, but rather say, well, don't worry about it. It's all fine. There's nothing to see here. Just take it, please. And... What we can, could see uh, in the results, because afterwards we asked them about two things. We asked the participants, would you like to take this vaccine? Uh, and do you have trust in the authorities promoting the vaccine? <coughs> and there are some, something with the, uh, with the animations that, that doesn't work, so you won't be able to see the uh, exact uh, findings. But, but what we found was that uh, when you are... Uh, presented with a uh, sort of transparently negative description, then you say no thanks to the vaccine. It reduces your willingness uh, to take uh, the vaccine. That's not surprising. People are reasonable. But what we also found was that the exact same thing happened in the vague reassurance condition. So when people are not being provided with the clear information, they're also thinking about, well, what is being hidden? And that reduces their uh, vaccine acceptance as well. Furthermore, we could see that in the, uh, among those uh, respondents who received this vague reassuring communication, they also lost trust in the authorities promoting the vaccine. Whereas the people who received the transparent negative information actually increased their trust in the health authorities. So this means that sometimes you will need to uh, lose a battle to win the war, so to speak. You will need to transparently lay out the problems that uh, is there in order to sustain the trust that is the critical long-term resource during a crisis. But you will only communicate transparently if you actually believe, trust that your audience can deal with it. The next example is to communicate clearly. Uh, and that is almost self-evident, but what I mean here is that you need to Describe your overall strategy to the public. Because what we have seen in the research that we have been doing and what other research teams have been doing is that the, the 
most critical resource or the most critical factor for behavior change are what you can call feelings of efficacy. That is, knowing what to do and feeling capable of doing it. That creates behavior change and it creates support for the overall pandemic response. So as a decision maker, you need to describe what is the strategy, what is the long-term plan. And you need to very clearly communicate what role does you, the citizen, play in it. But that also requires trust in your audience because things change. Plans doesn't always work out. But you need to trust that your audience can, in fact, deal with that uncertainty, that they can understand why you need to make the changes that you need to make. Finally, you need to acknowledge trade-offs. In a crisis like a pandemic, there are no pure solutions. There are only trade-offs to be made. Because when we suppress infections, it has costs. It has economic costs. It has costs in terms of mental health. It removes certain rights that people cherish when we, for example, uh, introduce a ban on gatherings. And all these costs generate a sense of fatigue. And what we can see in the research that we have been doing, that that fatigue elicits mistrust in the government, in the pandemic response, and it breeds conspiracy theories. So we need to buffer uh, fatigue. And what we can see in the research that we have been doing, and here's a graph from, from some of the research, is that when uh, interventions they uh, are uh, put in place, especially stringent interventions, that increases fatigue. We can also see that as, as time goes by, fatigue increases over the pandemic. That means that a lockdown in 2021 felt worse than a lockdown in 2020. We can also see uh, another thing, and that is perhaps surprising that when the epidemic is serious when many people die, then fatigue actually goes down. So when people can see there's a reason why we are in this situation, they suffer less from the interventions. So that is also a reason why we need to uh, keep uh, support because it actually lowers fatigue. So we need to keep support generate support, and we need to buffer fatigue through relief packages by helping vulnerable groups and so on. But again, acknowledging these things is something that requires trust in citizens, that they can, can understand that we need epidemic control despite it having these costs. The key problem is that if you don't have trust in the citizens, then it leads to a self-defeating response. It means that you won't communicate transparently. It means that you won't lay out your strategy. And it means that you won't acknowledge the trade-offs that you need to handle and that are certainly felt by the public in any case. So the only way or the consequence of that is that you then remove the trust, which then only complicates long-term pandemic management. So trust is the core ingredient. And in order to have a strategy, that sustains trust uh, over a prolonged crisis such as, uh, such as a pandemic, you need social science. So these uh, graphs here, they are uh, examples uh, of uh, some of the reports that we in my research project have been uh, sharing with the uh, Danish government, the Danish media and the Danish public. Uh, we have shared many other types of data, including ethnographic research, uh, including big data research on mobility and social media, uh, sometimes in even daily uh, reports. And we need that kind of real-time data collection during a crisis. We needed to identify what are the critical societal resources and challenges, how much trust uh, do we have, what do we need to repair, we needed to figure out what is the, uh, the right way to address the audiences that we have. How can we address the public in this specific country in a way that sustains trust? And finally, we need this real-time component in order to identify challenges as they emerge. 
when people begin to feel lonely, when they begin to feel fatigued, then we need to like, monitor the behavior, we need to monitor the support, we need to monitor these perceived costs such that we can uh, address them as they emerge. And with that, I want to say thank you very much. Mange tak, Michael, and uh, we will follow up on some of these issues uh, when we have the panel discussion. I think one of the issues that's already emerging is all this question about real-time information. And we know that also in epidemiology in general, this real-time information for political decision-making is becoming more and more pressing uh, for good and for bad. And uh, we might be able to look at that. And we like to then uh, also discuss with you, Michael, you know, to what extent the research you presented to us actually impacted on the government uh, response. Some of us dream that our research would lead uh, to different decisions, and uh, maybe there's a thing or two uh, to learn here. Uh, Michael said people are central in a health crisis, and I think nobody illustrates this better also than our next speaker, Dr. Julienne Anoko. She is a social anthropologist. She now works with the WHO Regional Office for Africa, uh, doing a really difficult job being a team leader in social sciences uh, within that environment, and she is uh, posted in Dakar in Senegal. Uh, she is frontline, really out there. And, you know, if I read this to you, a frontline outbreak responder for Ebola, Mar Marburg, H1N1, Zika, plague, COVID-19, you would hardly find a social anthropologist with more such experience. So, uh, Julienne, we really look forward uh, to your presentation. Thank you. Presentation, please. Ah, okay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. So I would like just to take you um, to a journey with me. Uh, I have a lot to say, but I have just selected, I select what I think can be important to take you with me. So we travel around across three or five outbreaks and what we are really doing in the field. The first thing I would like you to know is that health emergency lead to multicultural encounters and sometimes cultural clashes. This is, of course, is the truth. I've been working on this for more than 17 years. I always have multicultural encounters and clashes. So what I, what I mean by multicultural encounter and clashes, from one side, outbreak is Biomedical models, these are the models. They will explain this by talking about the hygiene. COVID is a virus. We have drugs. Disease is announced at the asymptomatic stage by biomedicine. We have some vaccines. Michael had just talking about, talked about the vaccines, the COVID vaccines. But these are other models, the cultural models. And these models, we have local explanation. The most important is the causality. What causes a disease? It's not the vaccine, it's not the virus, it's not the bacteria, but maybe it's a divine will or a trial. And maybe it's a fault, a breach of prohibitions. And most of the time, it's a spell coat that my neighbor sent to me to kill me. So this is what outbreak is. So what we have is that these models, they will clash. Uh, how can I use it? The green, okay. So, sorry. If this model clashes, you will have the problem, a big problem. The trust will be lost. You will have also conflict, resistance, aggressiveness. As you know, some of our colleagues were killed in the field during Ebola outbreak in DRC in 2020, and 2018, 2020, unfortunately. So, responding to outbreaks, we have social scientists in the field as 
we know. But we have a lot of information. When we have a lot of information, everything is interesting, but not everything is useful. As social scientists, what you have to do first is you, you know the context before you go to an outbreak. This is your role. When you have this data, during an outbreak, you have to select the information. You select the data. Everything is interesting, but not everything is useful. What is useful is the data, social intelligence data, social anthropological data that can help you to interrupt the chain of the transmission. It is not a normal anthropological investigation. You have, the, you have to have this capacity of selecting the data and useful data which can help you to interrupt the chain of transmission because we are working in the field with another expert when you respond to an outbreak. Sometimes we are 300 experts. And in the, uh, among these 300, maybe we are just only three or five social scientists like in this room. So what we need, we need data from social intelligence. And also we do rapid operational research. It means that in three days or four days, as a social scientist, you, you should be able to have data on the field, to share this data so that people can take the good decision to respond to an outbreak. So I will take you through this journey. We talk about these four examples, how we work to influence health policy, governance, advocacy, and how we influence high-level decision. The second thing I would like to share with you, some sociocultural aspect of managing an epidemic. Thirdly, how we engage community concretely. I'm not talking about theories. This is concrete example of successful interventions. And also how we build the capacity on the job of the rest of the team to support the response. This is, these are many examples. The, the, the woman there on the left is me in a high coordination meeting where I'm struggling to talk about, please, I'm social scientific, I'm here. Please, 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 give me the floor. It's not always easy, but I'm invited in the meeting, my colleagues and I, we sit there and we share the data. We help those big bosses to take the good decision based on the evidence from the field, from the people, because the people have to be the center for all the outbreak response. Secondly, in the left, this is a very interesting intervention that we made as social scientists during the plaque outbreak in Madagascar. We succeeded to take the government to change a law that had been ruling for a century, where during plaque outbreak, all the dead people are, were buried in a mass grave. And for six months, we pushed the community to analyze the funeral risk. And we pushed the government to change the law that was ruling for more than 100 years. And this was because one day we saw four guys running on the street with the body of their mother. The lady was died and they, she was buried and the children decided to exhume the body of their mother and to bury her in a good place so that her soul can go to the ancestors after. So they took out the body. They were running with the body of their mother Although with, the, with the, the, the stones and they were running and the police were behind them, following them. And those guys ran with the body of their mother. This was one of the reasons why we, my team and I, we decided to influence this protocol. The government signed this protocol, as you can see. The lady there is a WHO representative. We have a book. The protocol was, si was signed by more than 200 people from the whole country politician, from the opposition, from the, 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 from the government, even traditional healers, they came and they signed this protocol. And this is the new protocol that is ruling today in Madagascar to bury every person that died during a night, an outbreak so that the protocol can, the burial, the burial can be uh, uh, um, uh, safe and dignified at the same time. The next example I want to show you the, this social cultural aspect of managing an epidemic. As you may see, this is a paper that was published on one of my intervention. 
and uh, balancing burial rituals with public health demand during Ebola in Guinea. This was the issue of a young woman with di who died pregnant, nine month pregnancy, she was infected by Ebola. In this tradition, they have to open the body. They take out the baby and they bury the baby separately from the mother. And they wanted to do it because if they don't do it, the ancestor will punish them. So they wanted to take the body. The family was very angry. The community broke WHO cars and partners cars. So we prepare the response. How can we take the community to accept the burial, but also we perform a reparation ritual to, sub, to ask the ancestor, the ancestor for the forgiveness and we buried the lady. It was very difficult, but we did it. In my culture, you can't bury a woman with a, pregnant, with a baby in the womb. But we did it, and we prayed the ancestor, and we asked for their forgiveness. The other thing is here in the middle, a man, a very notable traditional heal, uh, a man died. And our response team buried the, the man far away from his land, 80 kilometers from his land, while the community has already opened dig, uh, a tomb. The tomb was empty. And if a tomb is empty, a lot of people will die. Women will die pregnant. Young people will never find a job. So the community said to WHO, if you don't repair this, you are not going to respond to the outbreak again. And we were in a war zone, attacked by armed, armed groups. So what we did, my team and I, we investigate how can we repair it. And we bury this banana tree. I, I, I think you can see the banana tree. The banana tree was representing the body of the old man. So we bury the banana tree. We celebrate the funeral in good conditions. And uh, all the streets were open. We were able to continue responding to the outbreak. I don't want to go. This was to prepare the ceremony with the goat. I, I bought the goat. And we shared the goat with the community, with the leaders. We celebrate everything. And uh, we rebuild the trust that was broken because we didn't respect the cultural models of funeral rites. Now, engaging with community, these are two videos. I'm not going to play the videos because if I play the video, maybe we will start dancing. But we are not going to play the videos. It just, when you have to build trust during an outbreak, you don't need to talk only about the, the disease, only about the, the problem. You can also dance. So my team and I, we analyze that in this context, with indigenous people of DRC, they love dancing. So when you visit someone who is afraid, who has a problem, if you come to him dancing and singing, you, he will start celebrating. He knows that you will only talk about good things. So this is what we did and we build trust because they refused the vaccine days before and after we danced with them, 500 people accepted Ebola vaccine the day after. So we do also, we build capacity, we support the surveillance. I was explaining to my colleagues that epidemiologists, when you have to investigate the case, you have to do the surveillance, you investigate, you, you made the contact tracing, uh, you know how many people was infected. But sometimes you have the gap. The gap is, for example, when you don't have the chain or the complete chain of the transmission. So what we do, my team and I, and my other colleagues, social scientists, we investigate this missing gap. What is missing? Something that is missing can be that the man who died infected has an affair with another woman. This was one of the situation. But that woman will never say that she was the girlfriend of that married man. So as social scientists, we... We, we have this good information and we complete the chain of the transmission to know who got infected by who, when, how, what, what, but we keep it in secret, of course. We never give the name of the person, but we just share it with our colleagues, uh, epidemiologists, for them to, to say. So here, to, f to finish, safe and dignified burial also means that never left someone behind. I, I, I see if you can see in the cycle there, in that cycle, we have an indigenous man in, in, in Congo and in Central Africa. They call them pygmies. So IPC team, Infection Prevention and Control team, they didn't prepare this PPE, the protective uh, material, for those people who are not so tall. 
So we ask to them, they want to bury their people. You do what you can to give him this PPE and train them because they don't accept anyone else to bury their, their, their people. So this is why our colleagues at the end, they did it and they sent me the picture to say, Julien, your recommendation has been implemented. So never let someone behind when you are responding to an outbreak. Finally, WHO has developed a framework. How can social science be inside this new framework called WHO? WHO have the framework is to better prepare, detect, and respond to outbreak in Africa. And here we have what the social science we want to do. We want to have a community readiness. We want to develop frameworks and tools, and maybe we will pilot this experience in some country, but at district level. We don't do it at national level, we do it at district level to see if it can work. We publish, we select this it in community, and we make a lot of simulation exercise to see if something can work. These are the partners we are working with in, in WHO Africa. So my last takeaway is each contest is unique even in the same country. Though the one size fits all approach is a failure for all emergency preparedness, emergency response and readiness. One thing, the respect, humility, trust in people and empathy are key. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Julienne, and we could have listened to you for another two hours, I'm sure, including the dancing. Maybe we can add that a little bit uh, later. There's a famous saying, uh, uh, if I can't dance, I won't be in your revolution. And maybe we must say the same thing. If I can't dance, I'm not going to be part of your pandemic response team. Uh, so maybe there's something there. So uh, now we have some other voices for you from all around the world, from other W. WHO regional offices as well. So I guess if we can now have the video uh, to uh, hear and see uh, those uh, uh, excellent uh, professionals and what they have to say. I greet you from my communities, the Miskito communities of Nicaragua, and from the Directive Board of FILAC. Hello, my name is Asia Odoglikolev, and I'm a Technical Officer in Community and Social Interventions at WHO Headquarters. Hi, my name is Mohamed Shafiq. I work as a Risk Communication and Community Engagement Interagency Regional Advisor with the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. Hello, I'm Heidi Larson. I'm a professor of anthropology, and I'm the founding director of the Vaccine Confidence Project. My name is Dr. Subhaji Good, Regional Advisor for Health Promotion and Social Determinants of Health at the WHO Southeast Asia Regional Office. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought us full circle back to WHO's definition of health, with physical, social, emotional, and spiritual dimensions of hu human life is inextricably linked. Social science plays an important role in the pandemic preparedness and response. It helps us to understand the social context of a setting, to understand communities, their perceptions, cultural and social barriers, enablers, and issues of vulnerability and inequality. The particular uh, contribution that social science can bring uh, into pandemic preparedness is it helps answer the why questions. Social science help us understand how inequity and discrimination impact people's ability to take control over their health and health conditions. In Latin America, the deep and historical inequalities and the different ways in which exclusion and discrimination occur have been exacerbated by the pandemic. And indigenous peoples have been among the most impacted sectors. But it has also been a time in which indigenous peoples have shown their capacity to respond. 
and adequately confront the virus and the lack of specific public policies. Communities are at the heart of our response. It is very important to engage communities as an active partner rather than passive recipients and involve them with the clear roles and responsibilities in our intervention to develop their ownership and trust and foster the sustainability of our interventions. When it comes to building trust locally uh, between individuals or uh, at a national level or even in the global context, the important thing that we have to remember is about building trustworthiness. We often talk about getting publics to build trust or building trust in publics, but we don't always look in the mirror and say, what can we do better? What can we do better to build trustworthiness? The way we inform people from different settings and culture need to be customized. We need to redesign, even co-design the messages and the process of delivering them to the people and with the people. Instead of viewing people as separate and self-contained units, a relational science-based approach recognises that we live within a web of relationships that shape and are in turn shaped by one another's emotions, positionalities, mindsets and actions, as well as our environment and experiences. We may have many opportunities to integrate social science in surveillance system, applying social epidemiology, reflecting distributions of health and diseases across social strata. What important is, how do we analyze the data and information that we gather? But we have also been able to see during the pandemic that, that there's a lack of enough data on indigenous peoples. There was no information on the effect of the virus on indigenous communities. And there's still not enough information on the access to immunization. We need to build data respecting different epistemologies. In my work, I have found the biggest challenge to be in bridging the gap between community engagement practitioners and researchers. Transdisciplinary research requires methods that have not yet been developed. It requires researchers to acquire an understanding of, of engagement that is multidimensional and reflects the connections between biology, relationships and lived experience and how to measure this. And the World Health Organization can play a very important role, promoting dialogue, exchanges and of course sharing advances with all. Thank you. We felt it very important to have those additional voices and I'm sure also some issues were raised that uh, we are going to take up in our panel. But you will see that someone additional has joined us on the panel, Marie-Amélie Degas-Chabra. She works at the WHO headquarters in Geneva and leads the Integrated Outbreak Analytics Partnership. And she might tell you uh, what that is. She is in the Department of Surveillance Systems uh, of the WHO Health Emergencies Program. And that notion of an integrated response, of integrated interdisciplinary research is, of course, absolutely critical and was also raised by uh, the voices in the video. So Marie-Amélie, having listened uh, to the two speakers this afternoon, uh, hearing more about them and now their, in quotes, official uh, presentations, how is that relevant to your work? So thank you very much, uh, Ilona. Um, good, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I think that those, those notions of trust um, is completely central um, and human, we're talking about human health here, so we can't um, take care of human health without humans. So, so the social science 
you know, focusing on humanity and humans is absolutely central, as you all mentioned, and this is very relevant and reassuring, actually, that uh, the projects, the Integrated Outbreak Analytics uh, Partnership that we have put together, and, and Julian knows well uh, about it, um, is actually focusing on trust with um, uh, the, with the communities, trust of the communities, open access information of all the findings that we that we have, and it's very context-based, grassroots, field-level information, and context, as we were discussing this afternoon, context cannot be globalized because by definition context is is, is very granular. Um, and this, definitely the work Julian is doing is completely in, um, in line, well the work we want to do is in line with what Julian is, is doing currently. And I think that also improves the accountability we have towards the populations we serve. Thank you, and I'm sure we'll come back in one way or the other to this notion of transparency also, you know, in relation to your data, Michael. But I do want at this point uh, to remind you that you have a QR code here, and if you have a question uh, to the panel, you know, please uh, uh, send it in. It's going to be curated to some extent, depending how many come in, and then I will check. So uh, I will not be uh, doing something else while my speakers speak, but actually try and find out uh, what uh, the questions are. Uh, so, Michael, I'd like to follow up with you. One of the videos was about indigenous populations and their needs. And I wonder if you can uh, share with us to what extent uh, inequity uh, was reflected in or with trust in your data. Um, inequity, you know, obviously with social strata, but... Uh, also in terms of maybe immigrant populations, etc. What differences emerged in relation to the trust uh, to in uh, COVID responses? So what what we can see in the in in the Danish uh, situation, uh, there was uh, there was a lot of inequity. So you could say that the pandemic has made clear what equities that there is in society. Um, so there was uh, social demographic uh, inequities in terms of uh, lower income, uh, lower education were uh, good predictors of, of uh, lower vaccine uh, acceptance, which is not surprising from a uh, trust perspective uh, because we know that, for example, education is highly linked up with different levels uh, of trust in uh, the institutional system. And also, as you mentioned, uh, immigrant communities uh, in Denmark, we saw uh, more uh, infection spread. We saw lower uh, vaccine uh, acceptance. And I think one of the uh, challenges that uh, there were in the Danish response was exactly how to actually engage with these uh, communities. So having uh, access to your research and to these very specific points, did the government react? Uh, yes, so the, the health authority and, and the government did invest uh, significant resources in, in trying to uh, reach those communities. And I think what is... Uh, what became uh, apparent was both what worked and, and what uh, didn't work. And one of the things that clearly does not work uh, is, is the press uh, meetings, especially press meetings where you maybe uh, put focus on exactly those groups uh, and, uh, and lower uh, vaccine acceptance uh, levels and higher infection spread. That is not something uh, that generates uh, trust. What matters is what works is local engagement with uh, local leaders, uh, people that, that they trust, and, and essentially uh, taking seriously their concerns when it comes to vaccines. Say, well, what is it actually that, that you are concerned uh, with? And the experiences was that it was possible to turn many people from vaccine hesitant into uh, people who got vaccinated if you had that conversation. 
Thank you, Michael. And that, of course, very much reflects, uh, Julien, what uh, you have also been saying and, uh, and working on. And I think this is an important point that sometimes, you know, if we talk about this kind of community engagement, people say, oh, yes, we'll do that for Ebola somewhere in Africa. And here, you know, in our part of the world, we don't really need to do that. And uh, I think also here in Germany, we saw the response when uh, the city of Bremen uh, suddenly started using an approach uh, along the lines of let's go uh, to the people of concern uh, that that was considered a revolution in the German COVID response and you know if you'd asked a health promoter or uh, maybe uh, somebody uh, like Julien they would have told you that on on day one uh, so I, I think it's it's very interesting that it applies to all societies in every single way But as we talk about the response, uh, Julien, there is one thing you highlighted also, that uh, in this case, speed is of the essence. We social scientists are frequently, you know, we like to collect our data, either qualitatively or otherwise, and then we like to mull over them, analyze them with 25 computer programs and what else. Mm -hmm. And then we finally get them published, and then we can talk about them. So how, is, how, how does this notion of speed actually impact also on the profession and the discipline? Yes, thank you, Ilona. Yes, we have this problem also in the field because you feel like you, a very important social scientist, you have to go fast. While you, 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 you always do things, you take the time, you publish after two years, eh? But now, if you want to impact the decision, we develop something that we call rapid, extensive data collection. You do the research in three days. No more. Because you need five days to put on the table of the decision maker evidence from the research. So instead of, for example, bringing on board five people to collect the data, Just bring 50 people to collect the data. So extensive data collection. So in one day, you can have a lot of information coming in. And the, the same day, w before starting collecting the data, you prepare people who are going to process the data. So you define, you put your, your, uh, your software in place. You bring people who will sit there, analyze the data. So in two days, you can have the first the first preliminary information, and after that you refine it. So this is another methodology. You have to go fast because your role is to influence the decision. It's not only to do the research, to do the research. This one you can do it and you publish two years later, no problem. But when you are in an outbreak, you are part of the response. And if you want your colleague, the other pillar to take it into consideration, you, we develop all these new tools for rapid research extensive data collection, rapid analysis day and night, and also publishing, sharing first preliminary data, and two days after, bringing data, refining the data, refining the data every day. But we need at least one week from the start to the end of the operational research. And this will also be dynamic. You can do the research on the first month, four weeks after, Behavior will change. The rumors will change. The epidemiological situation also change. Please, you have to do again the research one month later. In another thematic, maybe not only the perceptions, but maybe how people are, the gender issue, what is the, the problem of gender issue of the children. So you have some thematic that you have to investigate one month, another month, two weeks, so you are always active. It's like you're in a war, exactly, because the virus declares a war to you. So you have also to be as a soldier in the front line, no sleep, you work, you manage your team. Of course, fortunately, we have the money because WHO also put us the money on the table so we don't have to struggle about the money. Thank you. 
Thank you. Marie Amelie, how does that reflect in your program? I've seen you nodding yeah, yeah, yeah. No, every word that Julian's uh, been saying. So our, so our program, because I, 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 I very poorly talked about it and I didn't think it justice at all. Uh, so the integrated outbreak analytics um, is really an approach in the field that puts together uh, response partners under the MOH leadership. Um, Julian knows very well she's been part of that. Um, and basically, to make it very simple, um, in DRC in 2018-2020, you had an epicell that um, RKI supported a lot for Gorn, uh, and a social science cell that was put together by UNICEF under the MOH leadership. And um, as Julian just described, this social science cell had people all over the place that were collecting data, real-time data, and analyzing within three days and then providing inputs in maximum five days. Uh, and so they started working together and decided well, yeah, we should really work together and have been even more multidisciplinary. Um, and the idea of this uh, integrated outbreak analytical cell is to provide real-time holistic information to the coordinator of the response so that he, the, the decision he makes are really evidence-based and acceptable to everyone. So when Julien uh, mentions the three days to collect data, uh, contextualize, understand your context, um, and, and make, it, make this data meaningful for uh, decision makers, this is exactly, uh, I mean, she's one of the uh, unknown founders of uh, the IOA, but she is definitely part of it, an actor uh, of integrated outbreak analytics. So, yes, I'm nodding because this is absolutely what we, we endeavor to do. Thank you very much. And I think we can see here, you know, some people have been asking about this sometimes rather strange title of this hub about pandemic and epidemic intelligence, actually showing how, you know, we are looking for other types of knowledge, other types of intelligence. Uh, uh, Jean Julien was talking about social intelligence and was talking about emotional intelligence. That is absolutely critical for an out, uh, outbreak response. And I think we've heard a number of those elements. Before I move to your questions, I just have uh, one more question to Michael. Michael, you've indicated that uh, if you want trust during a pandemic, you actually have to work on it before. And uh, I've been known to say it's very easy as uh, one of the new big initiatives for research, SAPI, on vaccine research has said, you know, within 100 days we want a vaccine. But uh, I sort of asked the question um, at an out after an outbreak, can you build trust in 100 days, Michael? Uh, unfortunately, uh, not. It would be uh, great if you if you could, but uh, the, the the real problem is that if we look at at societal trust, then it's something that is built in in peacetime, and then it's a resource that that you then can use when the crisis hits. And it's because trust is is something that is related to so many societal structures. Uh, the it's about uh, socioeconomic factors, levels of equality. Uh, it's about uh, levels of corruption. It's about the, how well uh, political institutions uh, work. Um, but it's, it's really crucial that our policymakers understand how much they need to invest in it because it is such an important resource when the crisis first emerge. And it's very difficult to actually do something with it. In, in fact, if we look at our research on, on transparency in, in vaccine communication, then we can see that people who have lost all trust actually don't care that much about transparency. It doesn't help them. It doesn't bring back the trust. Thank you for that. And obviously that trust is not only important for a pandemic, but for any other kind of crises that might hit. I'm going to uh, now move to uh, uh, some of uh, your questions, and uh, here's one to Julienne. Uh, the question is, what are Julienne's favorite social science data indicators and why? <laughs> well, uh, my favorite social science data? Indicators. Indicators. Wow. Uh, you know, uh, indicators regarding behaviors are very difficult to have. 
I don't know how you can measure the behaviors. Okay? But what we do, we use um, rumors, for example, to try to measure people's indicators. So for Af in Afro, my team and I, we have settled a bank of rumors, what we call a bank of rumors. We have been collecting rumors from social media, from uh, community feedback, from everywhere. We collected the, those, uh, those uh, rumors and we put them in a sort of bank. From, uh, we collected from, I think, 47 countries of the Afro region. And uh, we saw that at the beginning, the, big, the, the most important rumor was, for example, we don't trust the government because uh, the government brought the, out the, the pandemic outbreak to receive money from, 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 uh, from, uh, from uh, Western countries. Others say that, uh, so when we saw that rumor at, at the beginning, we started communicating. We asked the government to communicate in, transparently, to explain to them why, when, uh, how COVID has come, uh, why we don't know everything about COVID. So we prepared some key messages for the, for the government to explain. And one month after, this rumor disappeared. And after that, we have the vaccine coming on. When the vaccine arrived, people say, oh my God, these vaccines that have been developed in such a, a short time, what is this? Why are they bringing this vaccine to us now? They want to kill African people, okay? This is the end solution, the last solution to exterminate all the African people. So we, we have this rumor and we started also responding to this rumor. And two weeks after we have another rumor. So for my team and I, our best indicator is controlling the rumors and responding to the rumors. We have many others, but this is the one that, how we can measure that our interventions are, are successful in the, in the community. So this is one thing that we use. We can have many others, but that one is my favorite. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I mean, in our pre-discussion, Juliet highlighted you know, the importance of listening, obviously. Exactly. And I love the fact she said we have to understand that morning gossip is a part of surveillance. Absolutely. So uh, I think you know, there are uh, some new uh, uh, developments where we have to uh, turn our thinking around a little bit. But uh, um, if... Um, if I could move to Marie Aurélie, uh, what, uh, they're asking here, what is the best way to integrate social science within outbreak responses, particularly under this uh, impression of, uh, of speed and rapid action? Uh, particularly, you know, we heard, of course, every context is different. Now, you know, the outbreaks emerge in totally different environments. Mm -hmm. How can one respond? You know, how can social scientists help here quickly? <laughs> quickly. <laughs> so I, I think that, first of all, our, our full objective is to have social scientists included in the teams. So they, they work together. Don't, don't, they don't work separately. Um, I think you've, uh, Julian insisted a lot about knowing your context before you go. Um, I strongly believe that epidemiologists should know their context before they go also, not only social scientists. Um, and so, well, they, they managed to do it. I'm not a social scientist myself, so I'm quite uh, amazed uh, of, of their work, but they did manage uh, social scientists, but also other disciplines to work together. So because they've been working together for such a long while now, uh, in our, because it's such contextual, it's long, uh, they speak the same language, they understand each other. So that also helps to um, make those quick surveys based on a need that is identified, that is raised by you know, the decision policymakers for the response ah, at the low level. Uh, and so the, the surveys they do are very targeted. Um, as, as again, as Julian mentioned before, social scientists take a lot of information and then every information is not necessarily useful at a given point of, in time. And I think um, one of our colleagues also in the video was mentioning um, how we need to develop new methodologies also. Uh, that could also be something that the hub contributes to um, developing those quick methodologies for social sciences. Uh, <coughs> so that it goes faster than it used to go. Thank you. Michael, here's a 
contextual question for you. It's, uh, the question is, are only certain, for example, Scandinavian cultures equipped to respond positively when the government demonstrates trust towards them? It is often said that this would never work in the United States, for example, due to inherent differences. You've, of course, compared countries. Could you say something about that? Uh, yes, and it's it's something that I often uh, are, are asked in, in different versions, uh, and 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 it is true that uh, a lot of things are easier in a in a high trust uh, country, but from the research that we have been doing, uh, then it um, then it seems as if the effects uh, are not different. Uh, Americans, they would like to be told the sort of transparent truth uh, to the same extent uh, as Danes. We don't find any differences in the effect of transparent vaccine communication uh, between Danes uh, and Americans. We have also been doing quite a, a bit uh, of research in Eastern Europe, which are also more uh, low trust uh, contexts. And again, we, we find that the, that the levels are different, but the basic associations are the, are the same. So a, a, uh, a low trust Hungarian uh, operates in the same way as a low trust Dane and a high trust Hungarian operates in the same way as a high trust uh, Dane and and they are oriented towards the same things across across countries and I, I think it's also important to say that that often I hear this that well this wouldn't work in in our context and but at the same time I think if we have if we have this relationship between uh, decision makers and citizens uh, and that's a, a uh, relationship uh, that is characterized by mistrust, then there are really only one who can take the first step in repairing that relationship, and that's the decision maker. And, and therefore, they do need to reach out and, and act in, as it was also said in the video, in trustworthy ways. Thank you. Uh, I'm just uh, checking what uh, question uh, fits, uh, fits best. Uh, but uh, let's... Uh, here's the... Uh, yeah, I, I know how, how I'll, I'll try and turn this. Uh, is there any of the countries, when you compared them, that had a higher trust after the COVID pandemic than before? Uh, on, on, unfortunately, uh, not. Uh, so we, we looked at, at eight different uh, countries, and, and in general, uh, it was uh, it was going down uh, everywhere. Uh, there there was uh, one country where trust increased in the in the pandemic management, which was United States. Uh, which uh, seems to uh, be associated with the uh, presidential uh, election. Elections, yeah. <laughs> Julien, you worked in uh, countries that were either in civil war or had just come out of civil war. Can you share the experiences there, uh, how trust is established if you come in? How are you seen? You gave us a very interesting example uh, during our afternoon discussion of how how even in such a situation you can build trust? Yes. Um, when you are working in this such situation of armed conflict, like uh, uh, as we were responding outbreak in a war zone in DRC, first of all, you have to explain very clearly your purpose and the purpose of your organization. So in our case, we were explaining to them what is the mandate of WHO and the mandate of all the partners who were working with us, like UNICEF, IFRC. This mandate should be clear. And it took them time to understand. So I think once you explain this mandate and uh, you, you talk to them and you show humility how you are, also demonstrating to people that you and your organizations are victims of a virus. You are not there to, to, um, to change something, but you are there because you are a victim of a virus. And this virus declares war on you and your organization and on the community. 
So it's important to join your hands, to join the forces, to work together. Because the only enemy is the virus in that case. I remember in DRC, people say, okay, armed group have been killing us for more than 20 years. We never see you. And now you come and you say, we have to trust in you. Where were you during all this time? It was critical for us to answer to that type of question. But we say, yes, we were not here because we, are, we, don't, we don't have arms. Don't Rachel, we have arms like technical guidance. We have arms like responding to an abri. We have experts. We have people who can come and sit with you, talk to you, listening to you. This is the arms we have, but we don't have guns. So if you want to listen to us, we can sit down and we give you what we have. So after struggling a lot, people say, ah, maybe let's go to see WHO, let's go to see UNICEF, NGOs who were there, IFRC. They don't have guns, but they have medicines. They have Ebola vaccines. They have uh, 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 some, some funds to help them. They can, they can support us with building some, a bridge in the, in, the, in the, they can mobilize women. They can fund something. So please, maybe if we listen to them, together we can stop this chain of transmission of abris. So this is what we are doing. What we are, what we are, our mandate, what we can do. But we never ignored the, the, the war. But we told to them, we don't have guns. We just have the medicine. If you want the medicine, we have it. If you want the vaccine, we have it. If you accept the vaccine, we have it. If you want social mobilization, we are there. If you want us to come and talk to you, listen to you, dance with you, we are there. So this is the things that we are using to build this trust. But you can't do it once. You have to be there in the morning, in the afternoon, tomorrow, yesterday, and again and again and again up to the end of the outbreaks. Thank you. Thank you, which again shows, you know, you can't just parachute in and parachute out. No. And uh, I'd like to follow up on that with you, Marie Aurélie, uh, with one of the questions here. And I'll read it out. While data gathering and sharing are important aspects of outbreak response, host countries are often, and it says in brackets, and rightfully, weary of parachute researchers among responders. How should we address that and how do you address that? We've heard an element of it already from Juliette. I, I didn't get, get, sorry, the, how, what the countries were? Uh, weary, uh, okay. Weary, yes, yeah. weary of uh, parachute researchers. Yeah. You know, too many of them come in, come out. So how, how do you uh, try and deal with that? How do you work with that within your country? And they also have lots of capacities in country. Uh, the thing is, our responses are often heavily funded, uh, and which means that it comes also with a counterpart that we need to send uh, internationals. Um, and I think this is, hopefully this is going to be less and less true as we try to really leverage capacity in countries. This is what, notably, I'm, I'm going to Nepal in a, in a, in a month um, to actually try to, to, not to try, to discuss with the MOH on how they can leverage, identify what are their academics, their different you know, social scientists, their different disciplines that could be involved in uh, outbreak analytics um, and create together um, uh, a team that would be an integrated outbreak cell uh, that could intervene in, term, in, in case of an outbreak. So what we uh, really um, want to push for is for leverage, to, to leverage um, national and local capacities. What the, there is currently an uh, integrated outbreak analytics cell embedded in the MOH and DRC uh, that is led by the DRC and they have uh, and we have received requests from Haiti and the Republic of Congo to help set up the same and it's actually our MOH colleagues from DRC who have been to Haiti to uh, mentor and coach them to set up uh, um, a, a, a cell, an IOA cell in Haiti. So um, the idea is really for us not to parachute people, definitely not. The, the um, team in DRC is also going to have a training center where they will also 
be uh, receiving people who want to train on multidisciplinary methods uh, for outbreak investigation uh, and response. So this is, we also want to push for South-South collaboration and start, I think it's weird for me to say that because I'm in Geneva, uh, but it is really what we, uh, what, what we want to push for, is really this leveraging their capacity and people c connecting together to create this community of practice in integrated outbreak analytics. Thank you very much for that. And that, of course, is a, a very, very central discussion also in the whole decolonizing global health debate. And, you know, who is there? Who has the expertise? Is the local expertise being used, research or otherwise? Uh, but also, you know, because academics do have to publish at some point, uh, you know, who gets to be uh, uh, on uh, the author's list mm -hmm. and, you know, at what point if there's 20 of them, etc. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, there's still a lot to do in that context mm -hmm. and uh, that definitely I feel WHO could help quite significantly mm -hmm. in also setting some rules of the game uh, in that context and, uh, of course, partly it's related to funding, you know, who funds it and who barges in, uh, but uh, that uh, rethinking of who who does the research and who gets the credit. We've had some awful examples of that in global health uh, where people have not gotten the credit. So uh, I believe that's really, really very, very critical. We're coming near the end and I'd like to pick up one of the uh, questions here that was uh, really flagged a lot and, you know, you, people vote questions up in the chat and this one, you know, really went to the top. And I want each of you actually uh, uh, to answer that. And it says here, what is the advice of the panelists for social scientists who want to make their voices heard in policy making? <laughs> Since uh, usually medical disciplines advise on uh, pandemic response, uh, and so how does one get those social science uh, questions in? Maybe you want to start, Michael. You've had a lot of experience here. Uh, how yes. did you get heard? Uh, yes, uh, so I think it's not very easy. Uh, and and I think my my experience uh, was uh, doing doing the pandemic in Denmark, uh, and I haven't been serving as a government advisor before. Uh, my experience was that um, there were two types of uh, of uh, scientists that were quickly integrated into the pandemic response. It was. Uh, health researchers, obviously, and then it was economists. And the reason why economists was quickly brought on board was that there was already established infrastructure for receiving uh, advice in the Minister of, Ministry of Finance, for example, from economists. But what there wasn't was an infrastructure uh, for how to rely on the broader social sciences. So one of the one of the things that I've been trying to uh, promote in, in the Danish debate is to, to have a, a sort of independent council that, uh, of social scientists that could bring the evidence to the policymakers. Um, so that, that would be one thing. But the other thing is, of course, that the organizations like the WHO who have uh, the ear of decision makers uh, can also be a, a way uh, in. But I think it's very important to think in terms of infrastructure because I spend a lot of energy uh, trying to uh, get hurt. Yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, you said health researchers, but, you know, if you look more closely at what kind of health mm. researchers, uh, you know, there was the complaint actually by the epidemiologists that they weren't in the advisory teams. Mm. It was only the virologists, for example. So even there, you know, there seemed to be stages of who was heard at what point in time. Uh, but your point about, you know, how are advisory structures, uh, how are they established, who is part of it? How interdisciplinary are they? Are they there before already to take up some of those resilience issues that we are thinking about? Or, you know, do they come uh, into play uh, the minute, you know, a pandemic uh, emerges? Now, you, Juliette, have been very vocal in the African regional office about saying social sciences need not only to be there, they need to be visible. Uh, so... Can you say more about that? 
Yes, uh, they need to be visible means that WHO have to, to recruit more people, more social scientists. Uh, I can say that myself, maybe I'm the first anthropologist recruited by WHO in a fixed term position since 2019, after working with WHO for 15 years as a consultant. So, so uh, WHO uh, understand, understood that this is very important. So I am inside, and my role is now to build the preparedness. What have been, I've been doing so far with other colleagues should be now frameworked in a sort of a, a, a good framework with tools to enhance the preparedness. How can we use this experience for responding outbreak to better prepare countries? Because we have many countries don't even know how to use social scientists. They say, we want social scientists, but we don't know for what. You know, just come, but do what you used to do, you know. <laughs> and now we are, we are moving forward inside our organization in Afro. We have just opened two fixed term positions again. They have been opened some uh, two weeks ago. Hopefully, we will have more social scientists inside WHO. And also, we have a bank of people who have been working, responding outbreaks, or we have, who have also, we are publishing. And those people are always called for response. And now we are calling them to reflect on how WHO can better support member states to be better prepared to, for, to, and to respond for outbreaks. So we have to build, we are again in the, in the sort of a building process. But as I told you, I, I'm inside. And inside WHO, I have all the opportunities in front of me. I have, I'm, I'm heard. I have a budget. I have uh, facilities. All the high level manager are seduced by social science. They say, just go ahead, go ahead. Do something. So I think today I don't have any obstacle uh, inside WHO to, to, to promote social science. To, I'm overwhelmed because they say, you, Julian, you have to go there. You have to bring people. I want you to, to, to send an anthropologist here. Yes, yes. I, you know, we, we, everything is now in place. It has taken a long time, but I think now we are there and it will be better every day. Thank you. Now, that's very, very positive news. Uh, I'd like to move to WHO headquarters, but uh, I'm not uh, going to ask you um, how many social scientists there are in the WHO emergency program. Uh, are they counted, Chikwe? Uh, <laughs> so we won't go there. We won't go there. Uh, but uh, maybe you know. Uh, but what I want to ask you, Marie Aurélie, because uh, you are an epidemiologist, and you know, how much social science did you get in your training as an epidemiologist? And uh, how have you sort of, well, let me use the word learned uh, to benefit from and learn from social scientists uh, like Juliette? Um, well, I've, I've had a particular training because I was in, in Bordeaux at the Institut de Santé Publique d'Epidemiologie de Développement, and it was at that time really a training focused on epidemiology for non-medical, really technical. So we, we did have this uh, mm -hmm. social science aspect, but we also did economy and management, etc. Yeah. Um, and we were really trained as field epis mm -hmm. uh, who should be interested in the context. But the more I've listened to all of you, and the more I'm, I'm with uh, my colleagues from um, UNICEF, MSF, LSHTM, ITM, and CDC, the more I have the feeling that epidemiologists nowadays forget that they should uh, be interested in the context. So I completely, when, when I was, when Simone Carter from UNICEF reached out so for me to be part of and represent integrated outbreak analytics in WHO, I told her, well, isn't that what epis are supposed to do? Uh, and we still have this little fight, uh, well, very kind fight together. Um, so I do think that just... It's clear that we do need social science. It's clear that we're not doing it properly when, uh, when epis are not interested enough in the context we're in the, in the field. So let's just, you know, accept that. 
um, I think there's a real momentum right now uh, with um, with Julian Julian's team in, in Afro. You know, it's just amazing that you actually have a team. We don't have a social scientist team in HQ. Uh, there, there's the sorry. Just to be fair, there is the collective services uh, with uh, UNICEF and uh, WHO and other partners and SHAP, etc. We have space in IOA uh, for you, so social scientists to come. RKI has also is leveraging a network of, uh, of social scientists networks and have regular meetings where they try to um, to see how they can leverage their findings with Albrecht, um, with epi, epi findings also. So there's a lot happening. Maybe because now I have my head in there, but I do have the feeling that there's a lot a lot happening. Um, not only since COVID, I think it started with uh, the Albrecht. Ebola in West Africa, um, but definitely with all the money that came into uh, the pandemic response, there has been opportunities to develop more, and social science is everywhere, community engagement, social science is in every speech, and I, and I see that we're making it something practical and real now, so uh, I think I want to be as positive as Julian is. <laughs> well, that's wonderful, and I think that's a fantastic message to the social scientists in the room here. Uh, to say, you know, make use of this opportunity, uh, bombard the institutions, bombard Chick, we're here, uh, to say, hey, I'm a social scientist, I'd love to work in your hub. Uh, so, uh, you know, use that opportunity, take it forward, uh, maybe create a group on this. How to, and maybe we turn the question then around how to best influence epidemiologists, uh, uh, not just policymakers or whatever. So I think, you know, there's a great opportunity. I think you have heard a lot this evening about the scope. Uh, moving, you know, from the kind of uh, research that uh, Michael does to the kind of uh, on-the-ground uh, work uh, that uh, Juliette does, the kind of integration work that Marie Aurélie does, and uh, how they all, you know, comp complement each other in every single way. And we've heard that all of them continuously come back to the issue of trust. And I think, you know, that is also, whereas we've been in principle and mainly been talking about, you know, how do we use social science when we have the problem, we have to actually also think about how do we use social science in preparing for the problem or perhaps even preventing uh, the problem. And uh, I think here also the issue of the contribution of social sciences to resilience and to a trust, obviously, is one of the key components of resilience, becomes absolutely critical and essential. So thank you for your questions. Give a big clap to this wonderful panel. Before we let you go uh, to uh, the well-deserved, uh, um, well, I, I was going to speak uh, Swiss German now. Everyone says apero. Uh, so um, I want to draw your attention to the fact that uh, there is going to be a third installment of this speaker series. Most of you won't be able to be there physically because it's not going to be in Berlin. We have been privileged here, but it's going to be in Luxor in Egypt. So I don't know if it's going to be within a pyramid or whatever. Uh, Chikwe is, uh, is planning here. And the tentative title is Leveraging Innovative Technology to Enhance Collaboration. But speaking of pyramids, it says in brackets here, this is not set in stone yet. <laughs> Uh, but uh, anyhow, it's going to be in uh, the, uh, probably on the evening of the 27th of November. Uh, so please, you know, look out for it. It's going to be exciting, I'm sure. And if you just happen to be visiting the pyramids, <laughs> let Chikwa know. Thank you. Have a great evening. <laughs>